Professor Timothy Parker is Assistant Professor of History and Theory of Architecture and Art in the School of, get this, Architecture and Art <laughs> at Norwich University in Vermont. It's, that's where he lives. Primarily, he interprets modern religious architecture. No, I should have read this sooner. Are you going to talk about religion? Um, he is co-editor and contributor for the recently published book, Sanctioning Modernism and the Making of Post-War Identities, which sounds really heavy to me. Um, he, talks about, he, he talks about his work all over the place. He travels internationally speaking about stuff. Um, and it, he's won many fellowships. He's been awarded the Carter Manny Award from the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts. And he is the lead speaker this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Timothy Parker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Al, for the overly generous introduction. I can actually see some of you a little bit, so it's a nice surprise. I kept thinking that I'd be entirely blinded. I have to say, it's a joy for me to be here. Um, I hope that some of the images I've brought today and the ideas I wanted to share with you regarding them will be helpful. At the very least, even if they're not obviously helpful, maybe they'll spur you to think in a slightly different way. Who knows? I'm coming at this, obviously, not from within the industry, so to speak. I'm thinking of architectural history as it pertains to emotion. And at root, for me, it's a matter of how do architectural spaces become meaningful to us? How is it that we find them memorable, significant, compelling? How do they evoke in us some response that's valuable? That's a big question. But I think it's helpful to look at it historically, not so as to tell everything there is to tell about that, nor in any way to give you a definitive answer but to ask you to, with me, highlight a few possible ways of focusing upon this question. The subtitle here, Space, Light, and Ornament. I don't know about you, but if you thought of engaging emotion in architecture, you may or may not have thought about some of those. But I think those three in particular are, help, are helpful to us in the following respect. Space, I would contend, is the key thing here. That is, I think the fundamental, essential act of architecture boils down in the end and from the beginning to the creation of meaningful space. A little more than that is needed to say, and I'll say that in a second. But likewise, that raises the question, how does space bring meaning? How is it actually compelling in the context of human experience? Light and ornament are two rather different kinds of things to think about. Light is, well, the immaterial thing in some sense, and yet, in a blunt way, without light, we don't see or really experience anything around us. But the manipulation of light is a central, obvious factor here. In a different, obvious way, ornament is important. It is something you can easily point to and see as helping to order a space. But it's also something I would contend from our 21st century viewpoint that's a bit difficult. It's perhaps more difficult than you might think to understand fully and to engage in in a contemporary context as um, valuably as possible. So I'm going to ask you to follow a whirlwind tour of architectural history with these two things in mind particularly, light and ornament, asking yourselves, as I will make a few comments along the way, what are the roles played by these two aspects of our experience of the built environment? I think as an initial stopping point, however, I want to justify ever so slightly my claim that the creation of meaningful space is at the root of all architectural acts. No doubt architecture happens and happens well, successfully, according to all sorts, all manner of factors. But it's the 19th century architect and scholar Gottfried Semper who suggested that there are at root four elements of architecture that boil down to the need to provide meaningful space, space that can allow human life and flourishing especially. In fact, the root of all architecture in his point of view is to provide space for culture to thrive. And this is a diagram from this text of his in the 19th century. 
what this actually looks like isn't so much important as how it outlines for us the idea of the four elements as concepts, as logical um, foundations for architecture. He's not arguing that the very first act of architecture looks like this, but he is saying it all starts with fire. It starts with the need to, in fact, protect fire so as to exploit it. So the hearth is the first fundamental element of all architecture. But it doesn't stop there. It can't. One needs to raise a mound to separate the hearth from the immediate surroundings and further nourish the use of it. In turn, one needs to cover it to protect it from the elements. And the covering, the roof, is understood conceptually as connected to whatever supports it. There isn't a separation logically here from the roof and the columns or walls that separate or support it. Finally, the enclosure or the walls is the fourth element for Zemper. Why does this matter for us? It matters at the very least because it suggests for us the idea that at the root of any architectural act, whatever it might look like, there is the provision of space for meaningful human action. And human action happens in concert with others in society and over time. It is over time, in fact, that from Semper's point of view, you have ornament derived from these four fundamental elements, such as is suggested by these images. For instance, on the left, we have a carving in a stone pot. Why carve it in that manner? It's not, from Semper's point of view, to make it pretty. You're filling that surface with a trace, in fact, of a previous technology that's rooted in textile craft that would have provided a surrounding enclosure to a work of architecture. Likewise on the right, the right on the bottom part shows us a remnant of a Doric ordered Greek temple. There's ornament, there is a pattern, the triglyphs and the metopes in the frieze. The idea of how to order that, how to carve it can be seen and has been seen as partly traces themselves in stone now of previous wood technologies, an echo of tectonic facts, ultimately. However, it's not only my suggestion that light and ornament are significant in helping to create meaningful, compelling space for human experience. I've said that it happens in concert with others, in a societal context. And so it's important to see this as part always of an ongoing living tradition. The term community has popped up here and again already today. I will want to echo some of those concepts and issues and concerns. So what I will do from here on out, I'm going to ask you to begin with the beginning and move rather quickly. I'll apologize for the speed. Um, we're going to go from prehistory to the 20th century. Um, buckle up. But I'm going to stick first with the so-called Western narrative because it's in that narrative where we do find certain correspondences, certain developments, and it will help us see this as an ongoing tradition, however plural it actually is. And then we're going to pause when we hit the middle of the 19th century because, as I will say then, it gets complicated then. And we will glance at a more global point of view. We will just barely look at other traditions outside of this Western narrative to make some of the similar points we've been making along the way. But more than whatever points I make, allow you to contemplate and think and ask yourself as you see these images, how is this working? How is this space perhaps meaningful, compelling, memorable, especially what role does light or ornament perhaps play? The question of the role of these things becomes especially important when we rejoin the Western narrative um, in the modern world in the 20th century, and it's there that we'll end. So I say we're beginning at the very beginning, really prehistoric, the Lascaux cave, Often the very first or one of the first things in an art history text you will see is that architecture, the cave itself, of course, was not made, but it was appropriated. It was made over for the use of human action in some kind of meaningful way. And in particular, it's filled with all sorts of paintings like this, paintings that in no way could have been seen or experienced or intended in a decorative fashion, to entertain, they were deadly serious. And they also weren't seen in light like this. I can't quite show you how it would have been seen because it would have been through very dim lamplight. There were lamps that are left behind, for instance, that show us this. 
great effort expended towards what probably, according to most scholars, uh, was a kind of magical, quasi-religious effort to render on the walls the sort of successes and hunt that they would need to survive. But moving more into something more obviously architectural, we have the mortuary complex of Zoser in Egypt. And here, there is an obvious precedent here for the later great pyramids of Giza and elsewhere, the stepped pyramid that marked the burial site of Zoser. Around the complex, we also find other burial sites marked by smaller pyramids, little temples to interact with them, ritual, etc., all surrounded by this monumental wall, a kind of fortress compound. But one enters, in fact, right over here, in a very small corner, far away somewhat from the grand theme. And it's through this little zone that I'm going to focus upon, because when one enters through this massive entryway, one finds oneself in a space so clearly formulated to encourage, but also solemnize procession and movement. This is entry, this is movement and transition, but it's not a casual one by any means. It's one that's marked by these series, as we can see, of spur walls, each of which are capped with a semicircular engaged column, the predecessor in some way to the columns of Greece and Rome, etc. But with this rhythm of these spur walls, you have a spatial experience that is not casually sauntered through. One is aware of the movement and of the effort made to exacerbate the severity of the movement, I would suggest. This is as it remains. A reconstruction drawing may give us a slightly better sense of how this is done, especially with regard to light, but also ornament. So for instance, here is one of the points to which historians will point for the creation of clerestory lighting. The fundamental idea we take for granted of allowing an enclosed space and lighting it from up high. The Egyptians invented this, and it happens most spectacularly here. So the shafts of light from up above are broken up themselves, reiterating the staccato nature of the spur walls and the columns and on the columns, engaged as they are to the ends of the spur walls, you find early versions of fluting. These vertical grooves, the striations, help to articulate that movement even further in the way that they combine around that curve visually and shift and move as one moves ahead. I said we're moving quickly. It's probably going to speed up a little bit. From here, we're already to late Greece. This is the Hellenistic period of Greek architecture. And this is a remarkable building in part for what it does that's very different from the standard Greek temple, which would have been, for instance, supported by columns all the way around. You see remnants here. This is an aerial view of what remains. And there typically is, in a temple, a rectangular space within that's entered through a particular porch. And that rectangular space is the cella where the cult statue object of the deity to which it's dedicated would reside. In this case, it's a little more complicated. And it has everything to do with the fact that one enters on an enormous platform of many steps and through a veritable forest of columns, through which one then steps up into a small pronoun, a, a, a lobby area prior to the cella, through which one can see, past these enormous columns, the innermost zone, but one sees something very different. One sees this area here open to the sky. This is a cella that has no roof. The rest of the surrounding building had been roofed, but this would have been now flush of natural light. Furthermore, in the middle of this open air cella is a structure modeled very clearly on a temple form. It is a temple within a temple. And this nesting nature of this temple is further developed and reinforced with regard to how you get there. Because even while you're here and you can look this direction and appreciate the great genius of the architect, right? <laughs> um, you can't walk down here. There's a low enough wall, high enough wall rather, that's low enough you can see past it, but you can't proceed. You have to go to either side and go down, descend into a dark passageway, combination of stairs and ramps, 
out of which you emerge here or here. And so you then have, when you get below, a movement away from whatever light there was to a cramped enclosed space, dark space, out of which again one emerges further within these nested precincts of specialness, so to speak, into, rather out of that door, into a realm where you could have seen in the distance the temple within the temple that marked a site of a sacred spring dedicated to Apollo, etc. The ornament, in its multiple variations on the standard Greek practice, helps this along. But it's when we come to the Romans that we find a further permutation. Meaningful space, well, space is all about enclosing, about defining space, about very often covering it, and technological changes had a lot to do with this. So the invention, at least the real extrapolation of the possibilities of arch and vault and dome are what makes Roman architecture all that it is. With the Pantheon, however, we have an amazing addition of a circular domed space but after, or found only after one enters, what appears to us to be a rather straightforward temple front, a nicely made Corinthian order Roman temple front. But when one enters, the act of entering itself signals a kind of transition with this coffered barrel vault through which one moves further and gets this glimpse and then is entirely surrounded by a series of ornamental gestures that give rise to another worldly kind of realm. This smooth concrete dome with the oculus at the middle, the only source of light here. So that from this vantage point, I can suggest one of the basic characteristics of this as a space. We see down below a series of columns in front of a niche, and then there's an edicula set in front of the solid wall, and basically that alternates all the way around. At the uppermost region, you have five rings of these coffers. The coffers are offset as they recede uh, to play even more thoroughly with the proportions as it shifts and curves. But this intermediary zone is really tricky and fascinating. What you're looking at in this region here, the two blind windows that have between them four pilasters and then between the pilasters a series of contrasting geometrical forms signaled by polychrome marble revetment, that would have been the entire uh, middle zone as that. Uh, what we see over here and here is an 18th century intervention. The scale of that finely tuned detail at that intervening level functions in the lines that line up and in the greater number of lines that don't line up with the above and below to spin off into an other world of the sense of the dome. And Hadrian, as the emperor, played upon this by seating himself in the very center of it. It's a temple, but he was the emperor cashing in a bit uh, prior to his death to his expected uh, divine status. We're moving on into a Christian context here, early Christian uh, church, Santa Costanza, as a variation or rather development upon what domes can do and what they can suggest for us spatially. The coordinating plan and section here outlines this a bit. The basic idea is we have a dome held up aloft on a drum. The drum in turn is supported by a series of double column supported arcades through which one moves, and a surrounding annular or curved barrel vault surrounds the whole interior sanctuary of the church, so to speak. So when one enters, in fact, the dome gathers a kind of space that is made special and separate and is seen as that. One is already in the church, but one understands clearly that one's not within the innermost space, even though formally that is laid out in a fundamentally different way. Experientially, it is because of the light, how that comes in above, but it's just as much because of the gesture made by the ornament, and most especially the annular vault itself in this wonderful ring of mosaic tiles. The mosaic tiles are mannered on typical Roman tile practice. It's not an invented language here of the early Christians. It's an intended claiming of an older tradition and giving new meaning to it. 
but it also helps to define this circular area as separate from the more special, more sacred area within. Hagia Sophia, of course, Justinian's great church, part of the development early on of the Eastern branch of Catholicism, Orthodoxy. Here, one has the idea of the dome again as marking a space in the landscape, but doing so in a very particular way through trial and error, as we know. The dome in the center, in an entirely centralized plan geometry, rests not on a drum here, but rests instead on conch or partial domes, intervening pendentives, and a series of arches surrounding. Furthermore, there's a series of arches that intervene between the base of the dome and its additional forms and punctuate at every level possible the areas of the building one would want and expect to be seeming as solid to support what at that time was by far the largest dome and space ever made. This idea of how one makes a spatial arrangement on the basis of domes develops not so much on the model of Hagia Sophia in orthodoxy, but instead, through its multiplication, you have the basic format here for most Eastern Orthodox churches, which is the proliferation of domes in a gridded kind of floor plan pattern so that the internal space might be monumental, might be memorable, but it's fragmented. It's intended to be fragmented, and furthermore, the ornament reinforces this. The ornament is all about filling the walls with individual icons, the cumulative nature of which is intended to express the sacrality of the liturgy that happens within. And then, of course, as with any tradition that is long enough, you have uh, rebel, rebel movements. Um, Bernard of Clairvaux founds the Cistercian Order and gets a little fed up with all of the glamour of the institutional church and really focuses upon simplicity, uh, poverty after all, right? And we have churches like this. It is finished. It's not an issue of somehow something being a work in progress. Here the idea is to take the form of the church, the central arched nave. You have side aisles. We're looking here at the entry from within the center of the transcept. But the ornament and the spatial clarity work together here to evoke a space, a gathering place for a particular activity, but not so much as to evoke an otherworldly atmosphere aside from enclosure from within the rest of the world. There is a cloistered nature to this, but there's a severity to it. The nature of the simplification of the orders, the capitals of the columns, the banding work, so to speak, reduces what otherwise had been a very ornate framework uh, down to almost a diagram. And that sense of enclosure is further reinforced by these wonderful multiple columned um, arcades here that help to define the cloister walk. We have with the Middle Ages something else emerge. And the most important thing I want to touch upon here is the idea of pilgrimage. And so how people interacted with spaces, that changes over time. In particular here, you have a Latin cross church, pretty traditional kind of form. But you also have the need for people to come visit and see a particular relic or visit a particular shrine, though they're not people who live here. They are pilgrims. And instead, what happens, of course, is the provision for this through the ambulatory. You have the further division of the space interior to the church into these little pockets that grow all the way around the church. And as one moves through it, the quality of the space then is therefore rather different, and it is reinforced all the way through by virtue of the ornament. The entry of the church as well uh, reinforces this, uh, the linear nature and the repetition of the iconography, the sculptural ornament here, is a very different kind of ornament than the Greeks and Romans did, which perhaps you could say, at least the architectural version, is more abstract. But there's a real figurative sense here that's important, and yet it's not given over to a kind of realism. 
Ultimately, what the figurative ornament does for the medieval church as it develops in time, and a significant stepping point here is Saint Denis, is it intends to increasingly evoke a, an analog to a heavenly realm, a heavenly order. Not so much a, a not understood space, but in fact a well-defined, clearly understood place here that is a prelude or a preview to what might come. And it's in the west end here, sorry, the east end of the church at St. Denis that these wonderful vaults come for the first time. The idea of the pointed arch giving more spatial flexibility to proportions in vaulting technology and the spatial implications. Clearly, it is seen most famously in something like Chartres Cathedral, but any other medieval cathedral could be used to make a similar point. But at Chartres, we have a very clear sense of how, still with an ambulatory, you'll notice, uh, the interior is given over more and more to a diaphanous kind of quality, so that the structure of what now is a rather large church is increasingly held by perpendicular buttresses. And more and more of the space, especially as one goes up higher, is glass. The glass, however, of the Gothic cathedral as an architectural conception is not really about providing a well-lit space. It's about providing an interior space that one would not find anywhere else on earth, and thereby is a window into the celestial. Carefully chosen blues, for instance, that were rather hard to make at this time for the stained glass, uh, make for a rather dimly lit interior, not one easily photographed, but a world of um, provocation and contemplation that's not easily forgotten. Now, it's time for something completely different, as Monty Python might say. The Renaissance changes all that, and we know. And part of it is the emergence of humanism. And if that means anything, it means the return to an ordering system rooted in ancient Greece and Rome, but most especially rooted in the human being. Still chapels, churches, etc. But Brunelleschi in the Pazzi Chapel, as well as many other buildings, orders the interior according to Platonic solids, clear geometric divisions, so as to create, again, a kind of peaceful interior here, a sense of separation from the all-too-uncontrollable world without, but one that is thoroughly rationalized. And it's this beginning point in the Renaissance toward increasing rationalization, or reason-based design, that provides a kind of link for much that follows. Along the way, however, there are fun troublemakers such as Michelangelo, who does the vestibule to the Laurentian Library, you are looking at nothing but the stairway to a library in a vestibule. And the stairway is obviously overscaled. You might call him the first postmodern architect, mannerist in the sense of taking a well understood language of form, but manipulating it with spatial and other implications. So the very sense of the overscaled element makes the whole seem much larger than it is. But furthermore, you have the walls treated in odd and idiosyncratic ways. I'll only point out one, the nature of these columns. Here, the columns, dual as they are, are treated in the round as full columns, not in fact pilasters or attached to the wall. And yet, while they have space around them, then they're embedded in a niche so that the whole is still otherwise a wall-based building. And to reinforce it, though I apologize, the slide actually did cut off a little bit of this. It doesn't rest on anything all that solid. It rests on this lovely little bracket that just kind of sits there. You might see this as the ornamental treating of elements that traditionally are seen more as structural elements. But with the Baroque period, such as in San Carlo, we have the idea taken further of trabeated or post and lintel architecture being warped and taking very simple modifications as a way to radically reform the spatial quality of the interior. So it's still classicism, it's still ordered on the ideals of geometry and proportion, but with a subtle shifting in the vertical realm of the plane, the undulating concave and convex forms, complexity arises. 
And one example that's really lovely in the adjacent cloister to the order that funded this, or many did this as well, you have something as simple as a balustrade, a simple contour for each baluster, but every other one's turned upside down. And you get this really rich interplay of light and dark and solid and void, etc. He does similar things in the planning of the interior. We're looking directly up, of course, to the dome. The sense of it being larger and grander than it is. It's a rather tiny church. But you have the forced perspective of the receding ornament of the dome itself. These crosses and octagons literally recede in size. And then they give us an opening here up through the lantern to sources of light that aren't seen. We don't see where the light comes from, but we see the light itself. And that is a key device in the so-called uh, Counter-Reformation Baroque, uh, appealing to emotion, appealing to mystery, when at this time, though I didn't bring images of it, various sects of Protestantism were instead insisting upon preaching boxes and trying to simplify further. The high point, perhaps, of the Renaissance is rationalizing everything entirely. And Boulet's uh, Cenotaph to Newton is a good example of this, never built, of course, but a kind of project of architectural conceptualization. But also in the Enlightenment, one has its own uh, kind of critical point of view. Piranesi gives us these architectural um, imaginings, etchings of prison scenes, the Karcheri series, where I don't know about you, but often people have responded to these as saying they're uncanny, they're a little disquieting. And in fact, one German scholar has taken a series of these and sought to discern what architecture in plan view would have been implied by a perspective. You can kind of take the perspective and reverse engineer it and see what the plan or organization of the building would have been. And in all cases, it's an impossible construction. There's just enough shown to create a plan that is impossible, that actually couldn't have existed. And finally here, the 19th century, Joseph Paxton uh, doing the Crystal Palace. I want to just pause here and glance for a bit at why this is a bit different from everything else we've seen before. This is an enormous construction, clearly about spatial enclosure, using a glass house kind of technology, all about prefabricated elements and what industrialized technology and materials can provide. The sense of scale was overwhelming at the time. It is a kind of global World's Fair that it was built for. But it's also something that, while it gives us a particular spatial quality, was not oriented so much around that quality. And in fact, this is made clear by proposals, knowing it was going to be dismantled after the fair was done, to put it back together in another form entirely. So maybe architecture can be about a never-ending, changing capacity for human occupation. As I say, I want to pause briefly here in the, 15th, in the middle of the 19th century in order to say that it gets complicated, especially with regard to ornament. And we'll come back to that in a second. But first, I want to see what some other areas in the world are doing. For instance, in the Buddhist tradition, the great stupa at Sanchi is really an object. No one goes inside this building. But it is a building nonetheless that creates a memorable spatial experience. One enters through this gate and then circumambulates around and up and over the building. This is a building that is evoking a walking meditation so as to achieve a kind of enlightenment. Buddhist practice will continue in this mode in Indonesia with the great stupa at Bodhabudur. Here we have a series of first square-ish and then uh, circular platforms that all are an elaborate opportunity for circumambulation, for a walking meditation. One sees, however, the route towards the end when one enters, but one well, it doesn't just walk up. One walks up and then turns, and as one moves around each platform below, one is entirely in a different kind of space. The scale and the ornamental richness of these balustrades against the human-made mountain in fact enclose one in a contemplative space. Until, of course, you get to the top where there are these 72 circular miniature stone stupas themselves 
that in fact are perforated within which each one has a little stone Buddha. And of course, as the legend goes, the solid one that's larger in the very center at the top has no Buddha inside. Not that we can know because it's not perforated. But the interplay here of presence and absence, all about movement in a decidedly contemplative manner. Echoes of these kinds of ideas, for instance, also in the Zen Buddhist tradition, rock gardens as a microcosm, but not the same kind of realism we may think of as the West, abstractions of nature set within an ordered, raked, gravel precinct that itself is in turn the product of a walking meditation and also a fascinating kind of multi-material boundary. The boundaries between interior and exterior are clear, but they are interrelated, and that is the whole idea of it. Also in Japan, Kyoto Palace, Katsura Palace, excuse me, in Kyoto, the relationship between architecture and nature is seen especially through the very rich ordering systems made possible by the tatami mats, the shoji screens, the material richness as well as the variety of translucency, transparency, opacity, patterns and textures and colors, all about changing in very subtle ways the relationship between interior and exterior. And the exterior is always present and become, can become almost entirely present if one slides aside enough screens. Finally, just a touch all too short of a survey for non-Western works on the Islamic tradition. While there are different kinds of mosques, this is a good one to look at for the basic formula of a mosque. And while it's important to see this as clearly marking the entry, there's a forecourt here, you have no question as to where to go, although there are lots of arches around. You're already within the precinct of the mosque itself, but not inside the mosque. That in the foreground is the ablution fountain. You need to first kind of cleanse yourself before you go on in. But when you go on in, there's a real subtle indication with just the doubling of these columns of that central entry zone. But otherwise, it's a forest of columns, a hypostyle hall, we call it, that's oriented in a direction towards a special place. But it's not an altar at one end. The special place within a mosque, of course, is not within the mosque. It's Mecca. As long as you have a wall oriented toward Mecca, then the organization of the interior is simply a provision, a space for gathering of worshipers who themselves orient themselves toward that wall, toward that space, and lay down the prayer rugs to further make it all happen. So back to the 19th century. I want to wrap up this talk by suggesting something with regard to everything we've seen that if I've at all been successful in saying that spatial qualities, however distinctive or memorable they may be, happen at least in part through ornament, I want to have us consider briefly what ornament actually means. How do we use it? How do we think about it in creating an architectural space? And from the historian's point of view, I have to say the 19th century is when people, such as Owen Jones here, start to recognize that there's a problem, that we don't quite understand how ornament is used or has been used. You see the title here is The Grammar of Ornament. He, in fact, creates this enormous book with these wonderful color plates, collections of ornament that he studies from around the world in different cultures. But he ends the book with plates like this. And the big point is, well, there is a text within, but the text is not nearly so compelling as the pictures. And most people read the book through the pictures and didn't really hear what his argument was. But in the text, if you do read it, he says, I'm studying all of these ornamental traditions, these languages of ornament around the world, so as to understand how they work how the rich variety of forms in ancient Rome still kind of speak the same language. But somewhere else, it's a different language. All in the midst of revival styles, the 19th century. Greek revival maybe signifies for 
the United States and bank architecture, government architecture, a kind of democratic identity. Gothic revival at this time maybe was all about it signals Christianity, etc. But he's saying if we are always looking back to historical form languages in ornament, we are not actually participating in a live tradition. And he suggests that we look to nature directly for creating a distinctly modern ornament. Now, I will say from here on out, there are examples of architects who tried to do exactly that, who got Jones and followed his argument, such as Frank Lloyd Wright. There are others we could look at. Wright in his Unity Temple here, remarkable partly because it's entirely concrete, not painted, not covered in any way. 1905, pretty early for that, especially for a church. Unitarian church. But here, the design is an entire work of art from the smallest detail of a lamp or a piece of furniture or the podium up to the cubic mass and interplay of form and volume of the whole. And for him, it was every bit about ornament. The ornament itself is a conventionalization out of nature, but not the sense of looking at a tree and trying to make something that kind of looks like a tree, but recognizing that the wood, for instance, that predominates on the interior comes from trees, and therefore there's a linear quality that naturally arises to the ornament. This was his argument as far as it goes. But of course that's right. Now, not everybody is going to quite uh, create the same kind of ornamental language. This is why we use the adjective Wrightian by certain followers, etc. By far the predominant way of thinking about ornament in the modern movement in architecture is to say that's what we need to get rid of. Or at least it's the problem. And instead, we need to embrace the engineering, the technology, the new materials, and what they make possible for us. Such as with Le Corbusier here, the Villa Savoie on the right, and his Maison Domino, his diagrammatic drawing of the possibilities for architecture given reinforced concrete frame construction. Namely, the walls can be whatever you want. You can have an entirely free facade. You can have ribbon windows like you see in the Villa Savoie because the structure and the enclosure are utterly separate. The structure is also so minimal that the plan can be free. And of course the roof can be flat. We won't get into leakage issues, etc. Technically you've got to have at least 3% and really know you're flashing, but aside from that, his polemic is you could live on the roof. You could have roof gardens, in fact. And of course, it could be lifted up. And he has this kind of romantic sense of lifting up buildings so as to let the earth grow more fully. On Villa Savoie on the right, uh, in fact, I would suggest there is an ordering device here. It's not ornament in a traditional sense, but it is a pattern of spatial organization organized on the basis of how humans move to it and through it. Adolf Loos, the Villa Beer, sorry, Villa Mueller, also shows us some similar ideas. Very cubic severe, non-ornamented exterior, but the interior rich in material. Maybe simple cubic forms, but a kind of role for ornament here. All oriented especially towards the interpenetration of space and volume. Uh, these, the way in which the stairway connects at intervening levels with the floors and offers repeated views out to the beyond. The famous Bauhaus gives us this transparency of the corner, almost a kind of macho expression of, look what we can do now. And finally, of course, Ronchamp, the pilgrimage church by Le Corbusier again, um, exploring the possibilities of space based upon technology. You have this enormous board form concrete roof, sculpturally crafted, and yet the interior holds that up aloft on top of, but separated by the sliver of, gra of glass from this thick, punctuated, sculpted wall, clearly demarcating the interior as someplace special, but also as a place um, wherein we experience something that is distinctly modern and not at all tied to what had come before. Now with all this in mind, I want to end with this image only as a provocation to you. Ornament, I suggest, we tend by default to think of as a particular kind of formal device. But if ornament is defined formally, we can never get out of the issue 
of various form languages being tied to consistent cultures. And if we live in a world of culture, it is one of the intermingling of cultures. It perhaps is the one of a crisis of community. Maybe too few of us have shared values and ideals and worldviews. Who knows? I'm not here to suggest that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I am here to suggest that the world clearly doesn't, by default, design or build in the same way as it has for most of history. Therefore, I want to suggest that space itself is something to pay attention to. Luigi Moretti, in the middle of the 20th century, did these kinds of exercises. He would build models of buildings, fill them with plaster, and then let it dry and rip apart the model. And you get here, for instance, a, a kind of a sculpted form representative of the space inside. Space, if it's cared about and thought about, can be articulated, perhaps not in recognizable ornament as form, but in a way that is organized so that it intervenes, it mediates between the human being and comprehension of the whole work of architecture. And in the end, that's what ornament has always done. It has been a mediating factor, helping to complete the work of architecture and helping humans to experience the built environment in a compelling and meaningful manner. Thank you so much.